Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuhu. Auzu billahi minash shaitani rajeem. Bismillahir rahmanir rahim. Alif lam mim thalikal kitabu la rayba fi. Hudr lil muttaqin allazina yu'minuna bil ghayb wa yuqimuna as-salat wa mimma razaqnahum yunfiqun. It's a book that has no doubt in its message and it provides guidance to those who believe in the oneness of God, who establish prayers, who believe in the day of judgment and who we spend out of whatever resources God has given. And this is what exactly we are trying to do to understand the guidance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in every aspect of our life. And in that context, we have chosen verses from the Quran that enhances our understanding of our own responsibilities towards ourselves, towards the society and towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We have brought together a team of uh, Muslim scholars, scientists, activists, laypersons to reflect on those verses of the Quran and prove to the world that uh, it's a book that can be understood by everyone provided they want to understand it. It is in that particular context that we have uh, with us one of the distinguished scholar of our time, Dr. Muhammad Islam Parvez, who is uh, a PhD in plant physiology. He's a former uh, vice chancellor of Malana Azad National University, Urdu University at Hyderabad. He's also the, uh, was the principal of uh, the oldest uh, uh, college in India, which was Delhi College and now the Zagir uh, College. And he is the, a science communicator, founder and editor of Urdu's Science, India's first and only popular science and environmental <clears throat> monthly. And I was researching uh, these science magazines in different languages, and I did not find e any other language other than Urdu that has this kind of distinction to have the science magazine. So the credit goes to him to start the science magazines in the vernacular languages. He is also the founder uh, and the director of the Islamic uh, Foundation of Science and Environmental um, Environment, which is a nonprofit and charitable organizations. He works on interface of Islam and science and environment. He tries to give a perspective in the Quran from scientific perspective and promotes a holistic education. For this purpose, he has established a Quran center in New Delhi, and he has published six books and more than 400 articles in different uh, uh, places all over the world. His uh, contributed chapters are included in books and encyclopedias, and uh, you know they include Harvard Press, Continuum, LIT, Verlag, and Sage. And his um, newest book is uh, The Scientific Muslim, Understanding Islam in a New Light. He has delivered lectures all over the world, mm -hmm. different universities and different colleges. And he has uh, attended several international universities on science and environment. We are honored to have Dr. Muhammad Islam Parvez today, and he would today be focusing primarily on the concept of ibadah, which he defines as submission to divine orders. Welcome, Dr. Islam Parvez. Thank you. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, as Dr. Islam Abdullah explained and introduced my topic that I will be discussing ibadah. See, why I chose this topic, the reason is that as a student of Quran and being a student of science, observing things in a scientific uh, attitude, with a scientific attitude, I discovered that uh, the word ibadah is translated into English mostly as prayer or worship. And under that category, we define certain prayers or the acts of worship like the uh, salat, which we call as the namaz or the prayer again, and the psalm, 
the month of Ramadan, we are passing through it and witnessing it. And Zakat, that is a charity, and uh, Hajj, the pilgrimage to Mecca. Mainly these are the things. But uh, do we have other orders, other divine orders, which go beyond these the five pillars, and how good or bad it has been if we are focusing on these selected five prayers, as we call them. Now, if we see things around, uh, what we find, say, for example, if we dissolve sugar in water, it dissolves. If we dissolve salt in water, it dissolves. Because the natural laws which control these things, they have given these particular properties and while you know that these are synthetic products, then come to the next product, you take any fruit juice, whether it's grape juice or citrus fruit juice. You dissolve in water, it dissolves, but you dissolve in, you try to dissolve it in oil, it doesn't dissolve. Why? Because there are certain laws which govern everything, be it the substances which are mentioning, I'm mentioning here, or be the creature, say for example, the green plants, Whenever green plant is there and sunlight is there, it will always photosynthesize. No green leaf will ever say that, well, sunlight is there, but I'm in a mood to rest. I don't want to photosynthesize. I will no more produce glucose. I will be resting today. No, it doesn't happen. So whatever laws Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given to everything, they, in fact, strictly follow it without any exception till they are alive, till they are in that particular constitution, they follow those rules. And these rules we see everywhere in nature operating, even in fact beyond our planet also. Now I'll be using a screen sharing to explain my topic. This is it, what I was saying. Now, this is the first verse which I'm choosing that and whatever creature that is in the skies and that is in the earth and the angels too, bow down that is submit to Allah and they do not consider themselves great to disobey. They fear their foster above them and do what they are commanded. What they are commanded. That is, they do exactly what they are commanded. This happens and it is mentioned about Whatever, every creature, whether it is living or not living, so that everything in nature, as I just mentioned, they always do what they are commanded. Now when, because of one mistake, the Adam was sent down to earth, this verse explains it very well. And this is, the, this is exactly, thereupon, Adam learned from his Lord some words and repented. That is for the mistake he did. And his Lord accepted his repentance. For he is much relenting, most compassionate. We said, get you down from here, all of you, and guidance shall come to you from me. Then whoever will follow my guidance need have no fear, nor shall they grieve. So it means when the Adam was sent to earth, it was said the bathing itself, Allah says that the guidance shall come to you from me. And this guidance we know has been coming one after the other. The latest guidance we know is the Quran. And Allah says that whoever will follow me, that is my guidance, says whoever will follow my guidance need have no fear nor shall they grieve. So this is clear from the very beginning that when the man descended and when sent down to earth, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala said that you will be receiving guidance from me. Those of you who will follow my guidance shall have no fear and there will no grief will come to them. So naturally this must be a primary concern for all of us. And as this verse shows it, that if you do not follow the divine guidance, then what else you follow? We follow our desires. And this verse clarifies it very clearly, elaborates it, that have you seen him? That is a person who takes his low desires for his God. 
will you then be a protector over him? Or do you think that most of them do hear or understand? They are nothing but as cattle, nay, they are even less conscious of the right way. So it means that if somebody does not follow the divine guidance, then what one follows? Naturally, one follows the own desires or the, the ideologies or the systems or the, uh, I would say, the set of laws which are products of the desires of certain people, the man-made systems, basically related to one's desires. So if we follow that, then naturally we are not following the divine orders. And this verse also de defines God. Who is God? Not the one whose name we recite often, but who, whoever we submit is the God. That is, if we are following our low desires, as this verse says, then our low desires are the God because we are submitting to those desires. So what we follow, what we do, that exactly defines that to whom we are submitting, to whom we are following, that is, who is our God. So our actions and our deeds, in fact, reflect that who is our God. Though we may claim verbally that we believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and always mention it very clearly and very loudly often, but are we following the divine orders as given by the God? If we are not, then we are not submitting to God, we are submitting to something else which we are following. Now this verse shows, shows the concern of an ailing father about his son. It says, nay, were you witness when death visited Yahoo, that is Jacob, when he said to his sons, whom will you serve after I am gone? Mat abuduna min badi. When I am gone, to whom you will submit? They said, we will serve your God, the God of your forefathers, Abraham, Ishmael, Isaac, the one God, and to him do we submit. This is the most crucial part. That we are Muslims of the same Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, of the same God to whom you are you have submitted, our forefathers have submitted. That is, we will be our ibadah. Mat Abaduna Mimbadi was the question. They said that our ibadah will be focused because we will be submitting to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We are his Muslims. Because if we are following the divine orders, the orders given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we are his Muslim. And if we are not following the orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, as most of us do, and why I'm saying is it because we all know this is a universal fact that a majority, I would say more than majority of the Muslims simply do not understand Quran. They read it, they recite it, without understanding it. So this is, this is in fact a paradox. It's very ironical that we, if we are not understanding Quran, then naturally we do not know what is there written, what is the order, what is ordained on us. And as I said, we have picked up certain orders from the Quran and we follow it considering it only the ibadah, not the entire book, the entire commerce which we have. So the concern of an ailing father about his sons was that who would you follow? And they said, we are his Muslims, so you don't worry, we'll be following him only. Now this verse says that if we follow the divine orders, then we literally acquire the color of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, receive the coloring of Allah, and whose color is better than Allah, and him do we serve. So, so the are going parallel. If you are submit to divine orders, we are submitting to Allah, that is we are Muslim, or if I may be permitted to say, we become Muslim. Because unfortunately, again, in most of our societies, a person is Muslim because he is a born Muslim. Now this born Muslim is something very weak and very difficult to digest, in fact, because you are nobody by birth. If we have a medical couple, then the child born to them will not become a doctor unless until he learns the skill, acquires the necessary qualifications and a degree. 
So similarly, a person born in a Muslim family has the advantage that he is born in a family where the book is there, the Quran is there. And if he understands the book and follows it, then as he follows, he becomes Muslim gradually. The more he understands, more he practices, more he is into Islam. Ya amanu Those of you who have acquired the faith, you accept or come into Islam completely. Now this completion of Islam is a day-to-day -day process. Whenever we address our day-to-day -day problems and solve them and address them as per the divine guidance, that this completion of Islam or submission into Islam is complete. So that again shows that how important it is to remain connected with the book, to understand it. And particularly this month where, from where the revolution of the book started, from this month only. So that's why this month gets an added advantage that we should not only listen or recite the, recite the book, but we should also understand it because that is the real purpose of any guidance. And as I showed in the very first slide, that Allah says that the, when the guidance will be sent to you, those who follow it will have no fear and no grieving. Then this verse again says that judgment rests with God alone and he has ordained that you should serve him only. Amara Allah ta'abudu illa iyahu. You should serve only. This is, this is an order from divine. He has ordained that you should serve him only. This is the one ever true faith, but most people do not know, which is the reality as I just mentioned. So we have no option. We have the only option to follow what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to do as described in the book, as described in the Quran. Surely we have revealed to you the book with the truth. Therefore, serve Allah. Abdullah, being sincere exclusive to him in obedience, now surely sincere obedience is due to Allah alone. Allah lillahi dinul khalis. Dinul khalis. The sincere obedience is due to Allah alone. That is, our submission, our following should strictly be to divine orders, to divine guidance, or to Quran to speak specifically that whatever Quran tells us to do in our daily life 24 seven, because Quran is a complete book of guidance where we have all the guidance which covers every sphere of human life. It's very clear. And then the other side also Quran defines very clearly that and who is more astray than one who follows his desire without guidance from Allah. Allah certainly does not guide the unjust people. The word which is translated unjust people basically is zalimin, qawmus zalimin. That is the people who are doing the zulm or the zalimin. Uh, it means whenever you have something and if you do not use it the way it should be used as per the divine guidance, then Quran declares it, says it as a zulm. And those people who are not following the verses of the Quran, the orders of the Quran, they are called because they are not doing justice with the verses. With the verses and with everything is very important. So it simply clearly says that if you are following our desires, then we are the people who are not loved and liked by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Now it again says, did I not enjoin on you, O you children of Adam, that you should not submit to Satan, since verily he is your open foe, and that you should submit to me. This would have been a straight path. This is Salat e Mustaqim, the straight path. And both the contrasts are very clear in this word that either you submit to Satan or you submit to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Either you submit to Wahi or you submit to Ahwa, your desires or the systems produced out of those desires. And now again, the situation is that if we do not know what is written in the Quran, then how do we know what orders, what divine orders are there? And if we do not know those orders, those guidelines, 
those guidances, then naturally we are not following them. What we are following, what we like, our own desires, or what customs we inherited in our family, and what is contemporary, what we see around us, what the society is doing. It, it means these are the followings which most of us are doing because we do not know what the Quran asks us to do for a specific phases of our life. Now that's why this verse is very crucial that most surely he who has made the Quran binding on you, Faraz al Qurana, will bring you back to the destination. Now Faraz al Qurana is most crucial because it is far. It is binding. Allah is ordained that this book is it is binding on us. Now we say for example we are observing Psalms in this month of Ramadan because Allah says Allah has made it mandatory. So same is the case with the other prayers which we practice. Say it, the namaz, salat or charity or zakat. But here it says that the Quran is binding on us. Then what do we do with it? If salat is binding on us, we offer it exactly on the same time and in the prescribed manner. If fasting or the abstainment or the psalm is binding on us, we practice it the way it should be. But Quran is also binding. What do we do it? We even don't understand it. And this is not only the case that it is binding, but as the next word, this verse says, that the tabiyum auzil alaykum rabbikum. Follow what has been revealed to you from your foster. And do not follow guardians besides him. That is the crux of the story. That how little do you mind. So this verse defines it further. That Quran is falls on us. Just like Psalm Salat. And we are asked to follow it only. Follow what has been revealed to you from your Rabb from your foster, from your sustainer. And if we are asked to follow it, then naturally the first thing, the first logical thing which should come to our mind is that we must understand this book. Now, if you do not know Arabic, then its translation is available in almost all the languages of the world. So whatever language I know, I must pick up a translation and pray to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have promised that this is a book of guidance. Now please make it easy for me. Give me guidance out of it. And we should read that translation the way a book is read. To prepare notes for it. Write down the do's and the don'ts that what we are asked to do, what we are not asked to do. The way we study any textbook when we were getting our education and those youngsters who are still going to schools or the colleges, they know how we read a textbook, how you prepare notes and you put your highlighters and sub notes and under notes and everything so that you can revisit those points and get the clarifications. So it clearly says it. Now, this verse I have chosen that Allah asks us, Tell my servants, that is obedience, who fully submit to my commands, that they should speak in the most kindly manner. Now, this is a divine order. And if we follow it, this is an ibadah. So, these couple of verses I have picked up to focus that these are the other orders of the Quran, which unfortunately, most of us do not practice because they are not in our list of ibadah or the list of the prayers, as I said, that the list of ibadah is mainly confined to the namaz, the psalm, salat, hajj, zakat. That's it. But here what it says, that whenever you speak, you speak best of the speech. Always the speech in the kindly manner. And this is an absolute order, that is, come what may, Whatever is the situation, one should always speak good. However bad somebody is addressing you, however abusive the person is, we are not supposed to 
react or rebut or reply in the same tone or manner because Quran asks us to always speak best of the speech. Yaqulu latihi ahsan. Now this is more inclusive and very, particularly in today's context, a very relevant verse of Quran which says that repel evil with what is better. Repel evil with what is better. This is itfa. This is an order. This is an order Quran gives us that never react evil with an evil, with a matching evil. If somebody is bad to you, either verbally or through action, you always reply in a best possible manner. And the outcome is also clearly defined. This is the scientific approach the Quran always uses. And the fact it explains that then you will see that one who was once your enemy has become your dearest friend. But no one will attain to such goodness except those who exercise perseverance and patience. Those people who, are, who have patience, and have perseverance. However, people discourage them. They continue to work in the same direction. That is perseverance. And they have all the patience to bear those, you know, bitter sentences and the abuses which are hurled on them or the bad acts meted out to them. But as per Quran, this is an, remember, this is an order from the Quran. This is a divine order that repel evil with what is better. And the word repel is used in the far. It means, Quran is true, that if we do not use this formula, if we do not use this way, then evil will never be repelled. It will be there. It will persist. It will continue. But it will not be removed. If you want to remove it, if you want to repel it, then you must react in a positive manner. Now, it means that this order is also part of our ibadah. If we are not reacting this way, we are not submit to divine order. We are not submit to Allah's command. We are doing takzeeb to these verses. We are not following them. It means, if you let me use this word, we are rejecting them or we are ignoring them. And out of ignorance, most of the verses, most of the orders of the Quran, we are rejecting. Now this is a very small verse, Adam. Now indeed we have conferred dignity on the children of Adam. Now, according to this verse, every human being deserves respect. Every gender, every class or subclass of the human society, whatever is the religion or the faith of a person, he deserves respect. That is, if I am a Muslim and if I submit to Quran, then I must respect every children of Adam, that is, every human being. And when you respect a human being, we respect his ideology, his faith, his likes and dislikes and everything. Now imagine if we start following it, respecting everybody, hating none, respecting everybody, people of all faith, people of all ideologies, however contradictory it is with ours, we respect them because Quran asks us to do. Then we can imagine what kind of society it would be. Exactly the society which we found during the period during the period of Prophet Rasulullah Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and during the Khulfaya Rashidin. Things deteriorated later on because gradually, period after period, we started moving away from the Quran. We simply followed what was passed on to us generation after generation. As in hearsay or as a practice, as a custom, as a ritual, if you let me use this word, and we move away from the Quran because they still, as I said, more than 90% of the people, they do not understand Quran and hence they don't practice it. It means their ibadah is not complete. Ibadah is not cherry picking that you pick up certain things from the Quran and then practice those only. 
Now it says, those who do not hope to meet us and are pleased with the life of this world and are satisfied with it, and those who are heedless of our signs, of our verses, of our ayat, their setting place is certainly defied because of what they earn. Because simply, if we are ignoring the verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then we are the ignorant ones. If we are ignorant, then naturally we are not following. Since we do not know the divine orders, then we follow other systems. It means we are not following the divine orders. We are claiming that we are followers of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but indeed we are not because our actions are contradictory to this. So naturally, because of our wrongdoings, we will be destined to fire. This is what again it says, and it justifies also. There is a logic, there is a justification. They are setting places, certainly the fire, not because Allah sent them to fire, they sent them to fire, no, because of what they earn. Because this is what you have been doing. This is what we have been doing. Hence, we are destined to fire. It's very logical. Uh, and that's it with the I complete. And uh, I, in the conclusion, I would like to submit that Ibada is a very inclusive term. It cannot be translated as prayer or worship. To me, prayer, if you use as supplication, that's fine. But if it is used as worship, then these are, I would say, to me, pagan concepts. They have nothing to do with Islam. The Quran asks us to be the people who submit to divine orders. They submit to divine guidance. And in totality, completely, they should submit to divine guidance. And there should not be no cherry picking, which most of us are doing, because you pick up any textbook of Islamic studies or search net just right away. See Wikipedia, you will get a list of Islamic prayers. The like we have Hindu prayers, we have Christian prayer. And Islamic prayers, you will find the, the Salat defined as the namaz or the prayer again, and the fasting and uh, zakat and hajj, and that's it, the chapter ends up. Now, on what basis we picked up these things only as ibadah? You see, their importance and significance, nobody's questioning. They are important. But what about the other orders contained in the Quran? Who gave this authority to us that we pick up certain orders of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, certain divine orders, and practice as practice throughout our life rigorously and forget about the verses, a couple of them I mentioned here that is speaking nicely. Then another concept is a wahasinu, do good to others. And this is such a strong order from Allah to, And same is the order of Iqra. These are the orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yakhara, wahasinu, itfabilati. So all these things, these are the orders. And I would most humbly submit and request you, all my brothers and sisters, that again, I would say, be logical. Read the book to which we swear, which we respect. Read it, understand it, practice it to become a Muslim. Thank you. Wow. Thank you very much, Dr. Asim. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, you know, you have brought up uh, a very uh, big issue before the Ummah as a whole. And, and if you go back to our history, you find that the prayer, which we call the Salat, was made obligatory in the ninth year of Prophet's mission. The fasting was made obligatory in the 15th year of the Prophet's mission. The Zakat was made obligatory in the 17th year of the mission. And the Hajj was made obligatory on the 20th year of the Prophet's mission. But there was an Islam before the all before all these things became. And certainly you pointed out that the Ibadah is a, is a holistic concept. When did we transgress and why did we transgress from that Quranic logic and clear Quranic mandate which defines our whole life as an Ibadah, not just certain hours or certain months or certain days of the year. W what happened? You see, uh, as I, you see, my approach is, Dr. Slum, that why it happened, when it happened, if we go into history, then a blame game starts. 
we are starting finding people responsible as i understand i may be wrong and this is what i practice it will not bring any good to further fragmented umma society so what i feel and suggest and what i practice forget whatever has been happening or happened let's look forward can we be more inclusive now can we understand quran and follow it in totality to be muslims because muslim is one who follows the allah's command and divinity as i mentioned a green leaf or a crystal of salt or a crystal of sugar or anything they will never deviate from the laws and they will not adopt these laws in partiality in totality so that's why everything in nature follows the guidance of allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in totality that's why everything in nature is muslim if i want to become a muslim i must submit to the divine orders in totality that is the quran in totality and for that i must understand the quran in totality so i feel that instead of traveling back in history we should look forward and motivate our brothers and sisters because islam doesn't ask us to force things in fact whatever i have submitted this is my understanding and everyone who is listening or watching it today or maybe tomorrow is free to accept it or reject it and those who reject it or even abuse me that what uh, nonsense he was talking i will have no complaints to them i will not hate them because this is what quran teaches me so take it or leave it but use your mind use your brains use your reasoning and see that what we are doing is it justified so i have raised a question that can we do cherry picking <coughs> from quran but how can we accomplish this this task uh, when we realize that the majority of the muslims as you rightly pointed out does not understand the quran does not comprehend it and when 90% of us are born muslims who 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 basically have total disconnect with the quran in its comprehension and understanding how can we move forward the only thing is that motivate people to understand quran right from the childhood you see when a child is born in a muslim family after he attains the age of 2 or 3 years he is introduced to quran what in this subcontinent called as the nazra quran that is he is introduced to the words of the quran and he is taught how to read it and how to pronounce it alhamdulillahi rabbil alamin ar rahman ar rahim Malik Yomiddin. He can read it. He can recite it. In fact, he can learn Tajweed and become a very good Qari. But he doesn't does understand that what does it mean when we say Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. What is meant by Rabbil Alameen? When we say Iyaka Na'abudu wa Iyaka Nastayin, what does it mean? He doesn't know and that's why he doesn't practice. So we should motivate all, every household that teach Quran with meaning to your children. and you first do it yourself because quran asks us to be muslims become muslims first for our own selves so each one of us who understands that yes we should understand quran to practice it should start reading quran so i think mission of each one of us would be who are people who have reason who can see things who have vision that first we should read quran understand it and put it to practice and then take it to people around us in our family in our society motivate them you can't force them don't force anybody motivate them that please understand this book and put it to practice this is the only way you see this is a happening which dates back to centuries i would say so it will take time but each one of us if we start doing it we will get results in due course of time inshallah there are two major obstacles that you know the people point out to one is that people say that the quran is in arabic and only arab it should be read on understood only in arabic and certainly in 90% of the muslim world population does not understand arabic and then secondly there are people who say that uh, it is beyond the comprehension of common person only scholars can understand this quran how would no. how should we For deal both- with that you see for both things i have scientific explanation number one if arabic language understanding of arabic language is essential for understanding and practicing quran 
than all those so-called Muslim countries where we have Arabic-speaking populations. Are they practicing Quran? In fact, those are the countries which are burning today, burning with all sorts of disorders and nonsense, I would say. Every damn thing is anti-Islamic, anti-Quranic. If, they, if their language is Arabic, and of course it is, they understand it, but what they do? <coughs> how, do how do they eliminate the people who are against them? How they are modified the economic system? How they are, you know, everything. There is a long debate and long topic which requires several discourses, several lectures, but we all know it. How much Islam has followed there? Their language is Arabic. They are born in Arabic families. They understand every bit of it, but still they don't practice Quran. What is the reason? We should pick it up. It is the attachment, your submission to divinity, your love towards Allah and his book, which is important, not the language. Point number one. Secondly, if you see Surah Qamar, repeatedly it says, We have made Quran easy to understand. Are there any takers? Now, this is repeated in Surah Qamar the way Fabi Yalai Rabbi Kumatu Kazdiman is repeated in Surah Rahman. So that's why I say now we should, our Qari should stop you know, uh, reciting of Surah Rahman, they should start with Surah Khamar. Because it is a beautiful word. It's a beautiful surah which explains one nation, how it disobeyed Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how it was removed. And then comes the word, We have made Quran easy. So if we are Muslim and we, if we believe in Quran, then we cannot say that Quran is difficult. When Quran says that it is easy to understand, easy to practice, then we are nobody to say that it is very difficult. These are the satanic people and satanic thoughts who say, no Muslim can say these things. So we can understand the Quran in different languages. And Now, uh, uh, this is the last question. I think you have been, uh, you know, you, you, you left your educational career to primarily focus more on the Quranic understanding and Quranic center. And you established Quranic center in New Delhi and where you are connecting with us uh, this, this morning. It's almost 9.30 or 10 o'clock your time. And we are at 10 o'clock at night in, in Los Angeles. So what n new things you are adding to this Quranic center which is not part of traditional Quranic centers or Quranic uh, schools and madaris. In what way do you think uh, this movement is a, a way for the future? In fact, I am not adding any new thing and I'm nobody to add any new thing. I am just reverting back to Quran. It is an invitation to return back to Quran, a journey back to Quran, back to basics, back to roots, because nobody will debate and question that Quran is the basic thing. It is the basic text, not only for Muslims, but the entire humanity. And unfortunately, we have not introduced it to the humanity because it should have been introduced as a model, which is practiced by society. You see, if when I speak of society, and suppose briefly, if I mention the Islamic society, a Muslim, according to Quran, is a person who always speaks good with everybody, who never reacts, never rebuts, who respects every religion, every faith, and every practitioner, and every God, be it Sri Krishna, be it Sri Ram, be it Jesus, be it anybody, with full reverence, with total respect, who loves everybody, doesn't have everybody, who serves everybody, is doing good to everybody, now, you can imagine a person in this society like this. My next question is, do we find it? If we do not find it, then can we define any society as Muslim society or as a country, as Islamic country? In our neighborhood, we have a country where people are fighting, killing each other because of finer differences in their orthodoxy, I would say, if I can use this word. This is not Islam. This is not what Quran says. It may be man-made interpretation of Quran called Sharia. 
but it is not quran and quran is binding on me it asks me to ittabu ma unzila alaykum ar rabbiku so i will follow quran i will not follow any man made sharia particularly if it goes against the quran so quran is the central pillar rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam practiced it throughout his life in fact his conduct his behavior his politics his economic policies his everything was a reflection of quran so the entire prophetic system is a reflection of quran so this is a model which has been practiced this is something which can be revived today so for our quran center we are just returning to our roots we are returning to basics so that we become good human beings we become a society which is loved and respected by all because this society loves and respect everybody you see i feel ashamed when i find that somebody is being you know targeted that he has abused rasul allah he has abused quran who are we to deviate from the quran allah doesn't ask us to hound people because they are abusing prophet no tell me single words which shows it so all these activities and acts are against the quran these are the rebels of quran who are doing it and they are bringing a bad name to islam a great disservice they have done and they have been doing for centuries and we all are mute spectators unfortunately and i believe we will be answerable to allah subhanahu wa taala because a person who is a mute spectator of any wrong doing is a part of that wrong doing so so what has been uh, the the response of the people so far to the quranic center and the methodology that you have used <clears throat> wonderful they like it they accept it they appreciate it because as i said i have no disagreements or hatred towards anybody whatever ideology you follow whatever is school of thought you follow whatever mazhab you follow i respect you but i will not follow you i love you as a human being and i must because this is what quran teaches me because you see before we are born as muslim and what we call as the islamic akhwa before that there is insani akhwa because quran says that we all are born from one single parent one father and mother so it means basically all humanity are brothers and sisters now this relationship of humanity is the first one and the supreme one and we must respect it a person whether whatever faith he or she has he is my brother or sister because we all are human beings we are siblings we are from the same parents adam and eve so what i believe that if you focus on quran understand it and see how rasul allah sallallahu alaihi wasallam practice it sira mubarak then and respect everybody in ideology then i don't think because i have not experienced any uh, any i would say opposition or anything at the quran center or in throughout my life so far so i am alhamdulillah comfortable and i it again says that a, uh, you see i am nobody a simple being like me is not challenged by anybody because i am respecting everybody so somewhere something happens on our side only when people start hating us or abusing us that's how i believe it thank you very much i think it was wonderful to having you on the program and certainly we will be back with you tomorrow also and the day after could you give just a slight review of what you're going to talk tomorrow so that uh, those who are listening may invite their friends also for the uh, well tomorrow. tomorrow tomorrow i will be talking about the concept of justice and goodness wonderful that is wonderful. adl and wahsino very important messages of the quran again forgotten by majority of us because in most societies we do not find justice <coughs> thank you very much i, I think we're taking it up to work Very thank good. you, Dr. Salam, so, and thank so, you, Islamic City, for giving this opportunity. Yeah. So once again, our uh, listeners and viewers, uh, uh, this was uh, Dr. Mohammad Islam Parvez from New Delhi. It's nine thirty or ten o'clock in Delhi. Delhi is under lockdown. He is uh, connecting with us from his home, and uh, while we listen to him, and then we bring this program to an end, this episode, we also pray. 
for the people of Delhi that may God give them respite from what is happening and may God Almighty give that country and that city and all other people you know the relief from the challenges of COVID-19. So once again, thank you very much, Dr. Aslam Pervez from Delhi. And inshallah, we'll be back tomorrow. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. And may you rest.